Good morning, Mosaic. It's good. Hi, Michael. It's so fun to sit up front and listen to all the chatter. It's good to hear. Um, it's going to be a sultry one this morning, I believe. How many sweating yet? I tell you what, let's stand up. We're going to get ready for worship. Appreciate y'all being here this morning. Are you ready to worship our Savior? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful morning. Lord, we're grateful for the weather that we have. I know we all pray for sunshine, and, but Lord, we are thankful for the sun that shines upon our life, watches over us, protects us, guides us, and delivers us, Lord, from all evil. Thank you for the power that we have within us through the Holy Spirit to live a life that's worthy as we are obedient to your word. Help us, Lord, this morning to come with open hearts to receive all that you have for us this morning. Lord, we lift our hands and we say, Lord, here we are. Minister, Lord, to us this morning as we come to worship you, to minister to you, and to give you all of who we are. Lord, for you are worthy this morning and for every day. You are worthy of all of our praise. And we praise you this morning with our worship and song. Bless Tony and whoever brings the word this morning, Lord, that it will be piercing to our hearts and to our spirits to be living out, Lord, every day the life that you've called us to. We give you praise and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.
joy I'll sing of on that day. No more tears of broken dreams. Forgotten is the minor key. Everything as it was meant to be. We will
find joy in your presence and joy in your the truth of who you are um, that we would overcome the things that can overwhelm and confuse and distract in a very real way so I pray Lord that um, as we work through the grit of the day and the, the week that we would um, kind of clear, clear the way and look up and see you for who you are this morning and speak to our hearts and minds in a way that would be transformational. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Do me a favor, shake a hand, say hello, learn a name. you could worship with us this morning. It is great for you to be here. If you are a first time visitor with us, uh, there is a white pamphlet on the back of the pew in front of you and it's titled Things You Might Want to Know. So go ahead and take a look at that and it'll give you more information about who we are here at Mosaic. There is also a gray connection card and if you're a first time visitor, you can fill that out with your information and take it downstairs and we have a welcome center. And so we would like to thank you for joining us this morning and we have a little something for you. So we invite you uh, to do that uh, if you if you are a first-time visitor. Uh, other than that, uh, that gray connection card is your tool to communicate with us. So if you have a question or comment, interested in serving opportunities or what's going on here at the church, go ahead and fill that out on that connection card. And once you do that, you can take that to the Welcome Center as well, or you can drop it into one of our giving boxes. We have them located out here in the narthex and out each of these doorways into the main hallway. So you can just find it there and drop it in. We'll be sure to follow up appropriately. We have some great events coming up, so we just really want to share those with you. We are having a ladies' brunch. That's going to be on Saturday, June 11th from 9 to 11 a.m. It is going to be at Dear Dutchman off of 97. Uh, so all ladies are welcome. Feel free to bring a friend. It is $9.99 for breakfast, and that includes everything. Let me tell you, it includes a breakfast buffet, a beverage, and tax. So it's all inclusive for just a short fee of $9.99. So come on out on June 11th uh, from 9 to 11. All ladies are welcome. So that's very exciting. Food and fellowship, you can't beat that. Mosaic Underground. Has anyone heard of the Mosaic Underground? This might be a new term to many of you. It's actually our youth group, and they are literally underground. They have taken the basement and they have redone it so that it is a great space that they can gather and meet for the youth. And so it's for anyone in grades 6 through 12, and they meet every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. They also have a special scavenger hunt going on on Friday, June 10th. It starts at 6 p.m. and it will go on through 9. And so what a great way to really uh, get involved, meet some people, and then uh, potentially feel more comfortable to going on Wednesday nights as well. So once again, that's for the youth grades 6 through 12. Uh, so join us for that. Thank you so much for being here, and have a safe and happy Memorial Day weekend. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Oh, that's right. All right. Okay. I'm going to pray um, because it is Memorial No, I'm going to pray anyway. But being that it's Memorial Day, I want to make sure that we're praying for the families of those who gave, gave up of their families for the sake of our the sanctity of our lives in, in regard to, to our nation and um, the sacrifices that have been made on, that be, on behalf of that. So if you join me in prayer. Father, we come before you. And we do. We thank you for a place to reside. You, my God, have created an earth that, that allows us to dwell, 
to see you in its creation, to know you and in your invisible qualities as we look at all the things that have been made. And Father, as we rejoice in, in, in the place that you have made for us, and uh, I pray, that, Father, we would never take for granted uh, the very place and the nation, but also those people who have died preserving this nation and preserving our freedom. So Lord, we pray for the families of those who have been left and pray, Lord, that you would comfort, that you would give them a great sense of dignity and pride in regard to the sacrifices that they have made and they would see the value um, of a life spent well. We pray for those people who are serving today and the families of those who are serving and pray that you would bless them and keep them. And may we continue to remember them in our prayers. And Father, as you guide us this morning, I pray, Lord, that we would not take for granted the freedoms that we have. Um, but in fact, that we would rejoice, that, my God, that you have done what you have done and the way you have done it. And that we get to enjoy those freedoms and the opportunities to worship you without encumbrance. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me in prayer. It's good to see everybody. If you've never been here before, my name is Tony. I'm one of the guys here. Just honored and privileged to be here with you. We've been doing a study through the book of Ephesians. We've begin, we're beginning the course through chapter 3. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to read in context chapter 3, and we're going to look at a couple different places, uh, and then we're going to dig, finish in, digging into the, the prayer, uh, Paul's prayer for the Ephesians in chapter 3 um, as we go. So before we do any of this, actually no, let's read, let's read the text first. So if you don't have a Bible, you're going to need one. There should be one in the pew in front of you. If there isn't, look around. I'm sure there's some, they're, they're, they're peppered around the sanctuary. Um, we use this thing a lot. We read a lot of scripture. Um, you can also get online. I know they mentioned that um, earlier that um, we have our, uh, uh, what's it called? View version something or another. The app. Yeah. If you go to that thing, it, it's been incredibly helpful. A lot of people have really enjoyed that. But we'll be in Ephesians 3. By the way, if you don't own a Bible, keep the one you find in the pew. If one would better suit your needs, let us know. We'll do, we'll do our best to accommodate you, um, whether it's large print or study Bible or something or another translation. Anything we can do to help you be in the Word, we want to do that. So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3. Did I already say that? Okay, we're going to start reading it, verse 1. I'm going to pray before we read. Father, we thank you for your Word. We pray, Lord, that as your Word begins to enter into our hearts and minds, that it would that it will infiltrate, infiltrate every nook and cranny and that it would, it would plant seeds of transformation in our hearts, minds, and souls. So, Lord, help us to see you, to learn from you, and to know you better. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we're not going to spend a lot of time in this front end, but I do want to read this in context. So it says, for this reason, for what reason? This beautiful thing that God has done in, in, in saving us, forgiving us, adopting us, empowering us, moving through, we, uh, you know, the idea in chapter 2 that we were dead in our transgressions and he brought us to life. We are now uh, works... Um, we are his masterpiece, created to do good works, prepared in advance for us to do. And then he talks about this mystery, this great mystery of bringing the Gentile and the Jew together in Christ Jesus, that he would bring peace between man and man, and then man and God. And he would do this through the person of Jesus Christ. He says, now for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, this Jewish man who was being trained to be a Pharisee, who persecuted the church at one time, was then chosen and called by God to be his mouthpiece to the Gentiles. That's who Paul is. Verse 2, Surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. And we looked at this last week in Acts chapters 7 to 10. And Paul's conversion, in, Saul's conversion in particular, that he was persecuting the church. Jesus grabbed a hold of him and said, You are mine, and then commissioned him to go out to the Gentiles. So that's what he's saying here. Surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. First, God's grace in saving him, choosing him, calling him to himself, then commissioning him with the gospel, and then the gospel specifically to the Gentiles. This is what God has done by his grace, his will, and his wisdom in, through the life of Paul. So surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, you, then you will be able to understand my insight of the, into the mystery of Christ. This idea of God reconciling all of mankind to himself in Christ Jesus, which was not made known to the people in other generations as it what has been now been revealed by, this, by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. So through all of this time, through the ages, this mystery has remained in the mind of God, 
and now has been revealed in the person of Jesus Christ at just the right time. Now this is really important for us to get. It's just the right time. The, almost all of the, this chapter 3 has to do with God doing what he does at just the right time. And we're going to look at that in a moment. So, in reading this, then, this letter that I'm writing to you, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, this uniting of Jew and Gentile in, the, in, in Christ, which was... Um, read this the mystery of Christ, which was made, not made known to people in other generations, ages before, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with in Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. Verse 7, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. So God, again, took the initiative to take Saul to draw, and choose him and drawing him to himself and commissioning him. Now, the reason this is important for us to understand is this is how God calls each one of us. So if we go back to chapter 1, the truth of the fact, the truth of the matter is, is that God sees us, calls us by name, draws us to himself, saves us, adopts us into his family, empowers us with the Spirit, and then commissions us to go. Each one of us has this commission to go. Now, Paul's was a special commission that he would, he would begin to deliver the gospel, this good news of a Messiah or Savior, to the Gentile people. All right? Ours, ours is, to the, is to the place which we find ourselves. So I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent, now this is important. Whenever we see what God's intent is, the next sentence is pretty important, okay? So he's saying his intent, God's intent was now to do this. Look what it says. His intent was that now through the church, now through us, through the Jew and the Gentile being made one. Those who are dead in our transgressions have been now made alive. That through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, to all the angelic beings. So God is unveiling himself piece by piece in varied ways at varied time, various times to all of creation, including the heavenlies. And this is an important moment. And this goes back to the statement I made right at the beginning. It's really important for us to recognize that God does all of this in his time. If we go back all the way to the beginning when God began to reveal himself to mankind, he revealed himself in chunks. Now, Adam and Eve lived perfectly with God. He, they, perfectly with God. As, he was, as they were naked before him, they had absolutely no shame and no fear of God, and they walked in the garden as if they were friends. When sin entered the world, it separated man and God, and from that point forward, God had to work to redeem man to himself, to draw man back to himself. In doing so, he revealed himself over time in different ways to begin to expose us to the fullness of God that Adam and Eve had, had, had lived under in the garden. But mankind having fallen away, God reveals himself one piece at a time. And so through different covenants, God made promises to man that he was drawing man to himself. So we first have Noah when he destroys the earth and Noah is left. And we have the rainbow confirming the fact that, that God would never do that again and never destroy the earth by flood. The next thing we have is we have, the, we have Abraham who was chosen to be the father of a nation, but also the, the, the father of nations, that all, of, all the people groups of the world, all the nations would be blessed through his seed. We then have the Mosaic Covenant when all of a sudden, so we have, we have Noah seeing God for who he is and, and get, getting the promise of life. We have Abraham who is now, re, have God revealed to him in such a way as to follow him and go where God leads and be given the promise of all the nations being blessed through his seed. Then we have Moses who draws that people, Abraham's people, out of Egypt and has given the law and the prophets to begin to say to, to say to mankind, this is God in a newer and fuller way. And then we have the Davidic covenant, that David would sit on a throne, and that throne is the resemblance of that which the Messiah would sit on, that the Savior would come and sit on that throne. And then we have the new covenant, which is Jesus coming and revealing the kingdom and this mystery. This is how God unveils himself over time. But it's also true in another way. 
In another way, it's true that when you, if you read through the Old Testament, there's, you can do a neat study. If you go Google names of God, what I would recommend is put Google names of God in the Bible and chronological. And what you're going to see is not only does God do this wonderful thing where he goes covenant to covenant to covenant, building a foundation on which he would unveil himself to the lost world and, draw, and, and, and showing himself more and more to, to mankind. He also, as people experience him, reveals himself in little pieces where all of a sudden the Jews would see God for who he was and they would give him a name based on how he proved himself. And so we see the names of God over time as he reveals another attribute to mankind, and they name him something new, and this is through the Jews. So God does this incredible thing where he just unveils himself in little pieces. Why is this important? Because that's how he does that with us too. So we have this macro view of God exposing himself to all of mankind one piece of time as mankind can receive it. We also have a micro view of God. That when God sees fit, he reveals himself to us in such a way as to meet us right where we are, just the way we need at just the right time. And listen to me, only in the right time. If he were to reveal too much of himself to us, we would have to run. If, we were, if he were to reveal too much of ourselves to us, we would be crushed. By his mercy, his grace, and his wisdom, he only reveals what we can handle at the time to see him for who he is as we need and can receive it. And this is his mercy, his grace, and his love as he exposes himself to us. So for me, when I first came, you know, with the idea of knowing God, when, you know, is, is when, I, when I finally came to him, what does it say in the Proverbs? It says, the, be, it is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. I can't know until I see God for who he is. And once that happens, there's a fear between me and him. There's this sense of awe. I realize he is God and I'm not God. And I have a choice at that moment. Do I submit myself to that God or do I hold in contempt and run from that God? For me, as I, as I, as I relented and I submitted myself to that God, I'll tell you how he, exp how, how, what he, revealed, himself to, how he revealed himself to me. I was relieved. <sighs> He forgave my sin, he restored my person, he made me a son. All these things were new, and I was just relieved. Now, once I was relieved, that was awesome, and I thought, this is cool, I'm going to go on like this. Then what happened? As my faith began, that little mustard seed of faith was planted in me, and it began to sprout up, and he was so beautifully tender as to allow me to experience it in him in a way that was loving and gracious and merciful. As that little seedling began to grow up, guess what happened? It could take some wind of opposition. And all of a sudden, he would show me places where I was weak, and that plant would begin to bend over. And he's going, ow! So he's showing me things about myself that need to be dealt with so I can be strengthened and be more like Jesus. And this is what he does over time. So 33 years of walking with Jesus, every day is something new, that he reveals himself to me in a way that, that confirms who I am in him and then shows me a tiny little piece as my faith can handle it. Shows me a tiny little piece of me that isn't like him. That's mercy. And this revelation goes on progressively over time. So, let's take a peek at this again. Verse 10. So it says, His intent was now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. This idea of him being, just revealing himself in beautiful and varied ways. Verse 11, according to his eternal purposes that he accomplished in Christ Jesus and the Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may now approach God with freedom and confidence. We may now approach God with what? Freedom and confidence. Why? Because he has done this incredible thing and he's revealed himself to, to me over time. Now, we're going to stop here for a minute because last week we talked about this word freedom. And remember what we saw was behind the word freedom is this idea of being persuaded. Bless you. So when we look at this, look what it says. It says, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom. Why? Because that word freedom means that we have been persuaded of the truth. We know the truth and we are convinced of it being true. And because of that, I can approach God with confidence and with freedom. Now, one of the things I wanted to make sure we understood from last week that I, that I don't want to have get lost is this. This persuasion are being persuaded of the truth of this is as progressive as anything else that God does in our lives. We can only be convinced of that which we know. 
So as God reveals himself to us, he, we now have this new knowledge of who he is, and now what we do is as we walk with him, we are more, more convinced of that truth. And ha- having been convinced, we are now persuaded of that truth. And that persuasion of truth and that new truth comes again every day. So look what it says again. And there's a reason I want to remember that this is progressive, and we'll talk about it in a second. In him and through him, faith in him, we now may approach God with freedom and confidence. We can come before him knowing the truth, being girded by the truth and strengthened by the truth of who he is and who we are to him. We now can come to him freely and with confidence. But what does this mean? Think about this for a minute. Have you ever been in a relationship where you knew you had to talk to somebody and it was totally, they were totally approachable? Like you had total access to them in such a way as to be free to come to them, but when you got there, you didn't feel free to speak? Anyone ever feel that way? That you have, you have access, you can get there, but once you get there, you're not sure if you can actually say what needs to be said. Anyone ever feel that way? Is that an unnerving thought? Isn't that an unnerving thing when you know, you know you have access to the person, but when you get there, you're not sure that you can actually say the truth? Let me, let me make sure this is clear. And this might be one of the most important things we learn in this moment. This freedom and confidence that we have in being able to approach God is that, you know, we talk about the fact that we now have, we are free to go into his presence. When the curtain was torn from top to bottom when Jesus died, and the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom, the Holy of Holies was exposed, and the invitation was given to us for us to go before God in his presence without the assistance of a priest going on our behalf. That's awesome. Here's what's next. It's not merely that we can go into God's presence. This word has behind it that we can also now say that which we need to say. So the freedom we have in coming before God is, yes, we are free to come into his presence, but here's an even greater and deeper truth. Not only am I free to be in his presence, I'm now free to speak. Think about that for a minute. I am now free to speak. Stop. Ask yourself this question. When I'm in a relationship and I know I need to go to them, and I certainly have, I feel the sense of the freedom I have to come into their presence, but then all of a sudden I'm stopped from saying the truth. What is it that keeps us from speaking? What are the things in our mind that keep us from being able to say the things that need to be said? It's usually fear. Fear of being shunned or being offensive or being offended. Fear of being judged for what I'm going to say or fear of being condemned. Fear of being laughed at. Fear of conflict. This is how important this moment is. You ready for this? God not only freely allows us to come into his presence, but he then gives us permission to speak freely to him in a way that alleviates fear of condemnation, fear of judgment, fear of, listen to me, Here's 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 a special one, you ready? Fear of having the right words. Fear of having the right words. How many of us have trouble praying sometimes because we don't know that we have the right words to say? Hmm. See, this freedom and confidence, having been persuaded of the truth, who God is and who we are to God, begins to alleviate not only the fear of coming into his presence, but then the fear of being able to speak and speak honestly and speak transparently. How did Adam and Eve stand before God? Naked, and there was no shame. This has been restored to us in the heavenlies. And this freedom gives us permission not only to come into his presence, but then to speak what needs to be said, even when we don't know the right words. Even when we don't have the right words. Because you know what? It's not, it's, God doesn't necessarily care about our vocabulary or whether we can say it right. And how committed is he to that? He says that my spirit will pray for you when you don't have words. My spirit will pray for you when, in ways you can't even begin to understand. That's how awesome God is, that he has opened this way not only to be in his presence, but then to speak freely, and then when we don't have the words and we're afraid we're going to say the wrong words, the Spirit speaks for us in ways we can't even begin to imagine. We have utter freedom before God. Why? Because of who he is and who we are to him, and the work that Jesus has done to get us there. And once convinced and persuaded of this truth, we can now come before him and not only come into his presence, but then speak freely. And it isn't a wonderful thing when we can be transparent and honest with ourselves and with one another. And how much more so when this is God. And he wants to hear our hearts. 
He wants us to pray those prayers. He is not going to condemn us. He's not going to judge us. He's not going to shun us. He's not going to laugh at us for stuttering and stammering and not having the right words. He's not going to turn his back on us. In fact, he will sit and he will listen. And he will sit sometimes even quietly. And there's, there's an even bigger rub, isn't it? You know, I've been married 32 years, and I like being married 32 years. You know why I like being married 32 years? It's because I know my wife in a way I've never known her before. I thought when I, knew, when I met her and married her, I thought, ah, I know this woman. This is awesome. After 32 years, you know what I figured out? I know less now than I knew before. There's so much about Sherry and the depth of who she is. The more I get to know her, the more I realize this is a woman I will never be able to plumb the depths of, ever. And if that's true of my wife, how much more is true is that of my God? And here's what's really cool. Remember when you were dating, those of us who were married, do you remember when you were dating and you were like, you know, you're, you're actually maybe thinking about getting married and you're at dinner and the conversation begins to wane and there are no words and in your head you're going, oh my goodness, there's, we don't have anything to talk about. This is really awkward. I don't know what I'm going to do. And if this is the way it is now, what's it going to be like if we're married? Anyone remember that moment? Oh, man, I must be the only one. Okay, well, here's the deal. Listen. Here's what's really cool. You know what happens after you're married 32 years? The best conversations we have are the ones where there are no words. Listen to me. (laughs) As much as I enjoy my wife's company, sometimes that that quiet moment when neither one of us has anything to say is the most loving and tender and, and most enjoyable moment there is of the day. When you grow in love and you grow in trust and you grow in fidelity and you grow in all these things where your relationship begins to deepen, the fact of the matter is, is words don't come. So we, when we come before God, not only are we free to come into his presence and speak freely, we're also free to come into his presence and then we are free to say nothing. And it's okay. Just sit with him. He'll speak for you. He knows more than you do anyway. About you. And about your circumstances. And this is the wonderful majesty of our God who just loves us perfectly, just in time. And just the right way. It's to not only allow us to come into his presence, but then to speak freely or not speak at all when we're there. And this is transformational. This is the knowledge we need to have. And frankly, listen to me, to make known that this is how wonderful this God really is. So let's read on. So, starting at verse 12 again, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with this incredible freedom, this having been persuaded of the truth and this confidence. And I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged by my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Verse 14, for this reason, I now kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, every people group, every nation who have been created by God and are now called by him. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, and I pray that out of his beautiful character and abundance, he would now strengthen you with power. He would now bless you. Bless you. He would now strengthen you with power. Now, here's one of the things I want us to do. I want us to look at these two words, strength and power, because in this context, they mean some different things. Look what it says. Ready? So, so for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family and nation in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his incredible, the richness of his character and abundance, he may now what? Strengthen you. You know what that word strengthen means? It has behind it the idea of confirmation, having been confirmed. You know what it is to be confirmed? To be let know that what you know is true, and that not only is it true, but I'm going to make sure you know that it's true. He's confirming the truth. That's what he's doing. How do I know that? Because the rest of the meaning of this word has an even deeper and more profound act. Listen, first he wants to confirm the truth in us, to make me strong, so that when I receive the truth, I will now gain upper hand as to prevail over opposition. Let me say that again. So he strengthens me by his spirit, and the strength is the confirmation of the truth, that I would know confidently and for sure that what I know is true. He would confirm that. And what that enables me to do is give me mastery over what I know as to have the upper hand whenever I'm opposed. Stop. What do you mean opposed? What could possibly oppose? 
Hmm. Remember last week I talked about the fact that I was talking to a young person as we were going, talking about this study, and she was saying, man, I've learned so much of this stuff, and I, you know, it just, you know, and I said, okay, and, and, and I, I, just think, I just think I've heard it a lot. I said, okay, that's cool. Let's go back to Ephesians 1 and review. We got to the verse that said, you are holy and blameless in his sight. And I said to the person, I said, are you holy and blameless in God's sight? Well, no. So I asked it a different way. Okay, well, do you see yourself as holy and blameless in God's sight? Well, no. no. All right, let me try one more time. Do you think God sees you as holy and blameless in his sight? And she said, well, no. I said, oh. Well, that's the truth. All the things we think we've learned, we don't believe to be true. What is he praying here? That not only would you know the truth in terms of being able to, you know, you cognitively assent to its truth, he wants you to be confirmed that it is the truth. In other words, once you know it, he wants to remind you of it and confirm the fact that it is true. And this confirmation strengthens us. Why? Well, because now we know the truth. What did Jesus say? He said, if you hear, what, hear my words and put them into practice, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will what? Set you free. He also said, the man, a man, the man who hears my words and puts them into practice is like the wise man who dug down deep, down to the rock, and built his house on the rock, the truth. So this confirming of the truth is what strengthens and frees us. And in doing so, what he's saying is, listen, I'm going to give you the upper hand whenever you're opposed. Opposed by what? The lie. What is the lie? That you're not holy and blameless in his sight. What is the lie? That you're not loved by God. What is the lie? That I can't possibly be loved by God. What is the lie? That I sin too much for God to be able to actually forgive me. What is the lie? When I doubt God's existence or his, his love for me or my salvation. What is the lie? That I can't imagine the Holy Spirit could work through me. What is the lie? What is the lie? That's the opposition. So what's he trying to do? To remind us of the truth and confirm its truth. What does that do? It strengthens us. How? So that when we're opposed by a lie, we can stand up against it and remind the lie of the truth. I am a child of God. I have been purchased by the blood of Christ. My sins are forgiven. I've been adopted as a son or daughter. I've been empowered by the Spirit. I am a new creation in Christ. He is making me to do good works, prepared in advance for me to do. Isn't this beautiful? That's confirmation. He's praying that we would be confirmed in such a way as to now be able to stand strong in the face of opposition when opposition comes. And what is that opposition? Anything that would stand itself up against the knowledge of God and the truth of God. Because what happens if we begin to doubt? Do we come before God free and confident? No. We begin to wonder, hmm, can I actually come to God? And even if I do, can I actually say what I need to say? And what if I don't have anything to say or I can't say it right? Will he listen to me? Does he care? And what if I sin? Can I still come to God? Well, yes. Yes, if you know the what? Truth. And I've been confirmed in the truth. And we give him strength to fight against the what? Opposition. That's what this word means. So look what it says now. For this reason, I... I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, and I pray that out of his, 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 the rich and abundance of his character and resources, he may now confirm the truth in you in such a way as to allow you to have the upper hand against opposition. And he will do this with power through his spirit. Power. Now, why is this important? Keep your finger here and turn two books back to 2 Corinthians for a moment, chapter 4. We're going to start at verse 6. We're going to see why we need this confirmation, why we need this strength, and why this is of God and not from ourselves. That this strength comes from his spirit and from his truth, and then the confirmation of that very thing. So here we are. We're at verse 6, 2 Corinthians 4. You ready? Here we go. It says, For God, who said, let, sh light shine, let light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the what? of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. This truth. Verse 7. 
But now we have this treasure in what? In what? We have this treasure in jars of clay or earthen vessels. You know what this actually, what, what kind of jar of clay this is? This is not the pretty glazed vase that we think about. This is actually more like the red clay that we plant plants in. Fragile, frail, easily broken. This is really important. Why do we need such confirmation? Why do we need the power of God to remind us who we are and the truth of who we are and who he is and who we are in him? Because we're so easily broken. We're so easily cracked. We're so frail and we're so fragile. He knows and remembers that we are made out of dust, and so he cares for us carefully and mercifully. This is a beautiful thought. He knows that we're made out of a dust, and so he cares for us with tender mercy. Look what it goes on to say. Because there's something even more profound in this. We need to remember who this... You know, Matt Matt picked a perfect song in in the middle of our worship. Jesus at the center. And during the first service, I had to actually pray with the congregation that that the verses of those songs. Do you know why? Because I'm too apt to want to be the center. And I needed to just confess that I cannot be the center. Look what it says here now. But we have this treasure, this beautiful, this beautiful God's glory displayed in the face face of Christ, this knowledge of the truth and the power of Jesus in us. We have this treasure in jars of clay to do what? To show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. He is on display in and through us, in our frailty and our and how easily broken we can be. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in, not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. The power of God in us. And the confirmation of the truth that we now walk with God, filled with God, on display. And the reason we need that confirmation is because of how frail we are. And how easily swayed we can be. God continues to move. So we're, we're going to go on and we're going to, he, 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 this is, he get, begins to nail this down. So let's go back to, um, go back to Ephesians now. So, verse 16 again, it says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you, give you the strength and the, and the confirmation of the truth that allows you to stand against and overcome, have the upper hand against opposition with power, this incredible power of God, excellence in soul and excellence in nature. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner person, your inner being, your heart, your soul, your conscience. So that, and that that phrase so that is so important, so that Christ may do what? Christ may dwell in you. We talked about dwelling last week, so I don't want to belabor this too much, but there's something I want to make sure we understand. As progressive as it is that God reveals himself to us, and he, just at the right time and just the right way, just as we can receive it, then he stacks those, not that, those truths on top of each other to give us a fully orbed view of God, as, and it grows as we grow with him. So it is with the dwelling of, of him in our heart. Because here's the deal. When we're saved, this is what happens. He calls to us, right? And he wins us over, forgiving our sin. And then he puts his Holy Spirit in us and he resides in us. That happens immediately and it happens indelibly. In other words, it can't be removed. So he is residing in us. So this idea of dwelling and having this perfect and exact rep, uh, residence for God to, to permanently dwell in has not to do with, he's there when we're saved, but this is what it means. This idea of dwelling also means that he pervades, right? And he prompts. Pervade meaning he saturates, works through and saturates. That he prompts us toward himself and toward his commands, and then he governs our lives. Well, if, 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 if he progressively reveals himself to us as to allow us to grow into his likeness more and more and to see him more and more as we're able to handle it, so it is with his dwelling inside of us. Let me give you a good example, a basic example. I used to grind steel. Okay, I used to inspect welds and grind welds just to make sure that they were good. Now, I was a Christian. I, worked, I was working in a shop, and, and, you know, that's a lot of welds. I used to work on these big, ex- really expensive cabinets. What I would do is I would start grinding those welds, and there's tons of welds in each one of these cabinets. And sometimes you get to the point where you've seen enough welds, you've ground enough welds, and you trust your welders enough, you're like, ah, there's some welds I'm not going to worry about. 
can't see him anyway, it's going to be okay. What happened? Hmm. God said, okay, Anthony, here's the deal. I'm going to prompt you. So I'm going to begin to, I'm going to, begin to pervade you. I'm going to begin to work through you, and I'm going to, I'm going to begin to tweak little areas of you that I, you've not allowed me to reside in yet. And one of them is going to be your work ethic. But let me talk to you about your work ethic. Your work ethic isn't just about how well you do your job. It's about how well you honor your boss and respect the recipients of this piece of equipment who are going to pay good money to get this piece of equipment and all those people that rely on that equipment being well done and well taken care of and well constructed. Respecting everybody, who, everybody else who's worked on this. And then, not to top it all off, he shows me this verse and it says, everything you do, you do as unto Jesus. I'm like, go! And all of a sudden, this progressive knowledge of God, God reveals himself to me in a progressive way, and in doing so, he gets into me in a progressive way, and begins to dwell in places, and begins to what? Rattle doorknobs. I wasn't ready for him to, I didn't think I was ready for him to try to open. And I'm holding on to the doorknob, hoping he doesn't get in. But realizing that the truth he is speaking to me by his spirit is showing me that he, he's calling me to be more and more like his son, and now it's up to me to cooperate with God, his truth, and the Holy Spirit in me. You know what I had to do? I had to inspect every weld. Not only did I have to inspect every, any weld, I had to make sure they were ground perfectly. Not only should they be ground perfectly, but every one of them, whether seen or unseen, need to be perfectly inspected, perfectly ground, and then made sure that they're sanded down to a smooth so that the coating fits on there perfectly. And then I go back, and I even started checking all the coating to make sure the coating was what it was supposed to be, making sure when it got delivered that nobody nicked it on the way to, because why? That work was not only to be done well, but it was to be done well in a way that would reflect God in me. It would be a testimony to myself. It would be a testimony to my boss. It would be a testimony to everybody else I work with, the testimony of the person who bought that cabinet, who utilized that cabinet, and had to go later into work in that cabinet. My whole life was transformed by one stinking weld. Because the weld had nothing to do with it, did it? God was looking at my character, informing me, and saying to me, Anthony, Anthony, this is how we work when we love. This is how we work when we honor. This is how we work when we respect. This is how we work when, you're, when, when you want to make sure you're earning your wage, and you're honoring your boss, and you're respecting the one who buys, and you're a testimony to the people around you, and everything you do, they look at, and they look at through the eye of knowing that you're my child. That changes how you do things. It changes you. This is what he's praying for us. That God would begin to dwell in us. The Holy Spirit would make room for Jesus in us in such a way as to allow him to be pervasive and to be able to leak into areas where he's not yet allowed. And he does this over time as, and revealing those areas where we have yet to give him full and free residence until we're ready to let go of the doorknob. And then prompting us, he then governs us, and we begin to live the way Jesus lives. Isn't that beautiful? So let's, let's finish this up. So he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through the Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Have a beautiful home that is a perfect residence, exactly fitting him, and progressively grows into every part of your person. And I pray that you, now being rooted and established in love, being deeply rooted in the fact that you are loved and established foundationally, so that when, listen, so that when opposition comes, you are not swayed. That's what we're talking about. Remember we were talking about having the strength to stand against, the, have the upper hand against opposition? So it is here that the love of God, the knowledge of the love of God would be such, it would be so foundational that when opposition comes or any doubts come, we are not swayed by it, but we're firmly established in this truth. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and now I pray that you, being rooted and established in this love, may now have, now this is really important, we see what that love is. Look, look, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may now have power together with all the Lord's holy people to do what? To be able to comprehend or grasp this love. Look what it says. Now I want to go back and I want you to see what this word power means. Because everywhere we go, power means a little, something a little bit different. And so this is what this word power means. You ready? This word power, look what it says. We're going to put it in context one more time. 
It says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you, allow you to overcome opposition with power through his spirit in your inner self, in your inner being, the, the gut of who you are, so that Christ may have this exact and perfect and permanent residence in your home, beginning to permeate, you know, to be, permeate every aspect of who you are as to govern you in your heart through faith. And I pray now that being rooted, fully rooted and established, found foundationally in love so that you cannot be swayed, you may now have power that enables you to overcome the difficulties in understanding this love. That's what that power is. Stop. You ever wonder how God can love you? No, no. You know that moment when you want to come and pray and you know you can come into his presence, but you're a little embarrassed and now you're not even sure if you're allowed to say what you're supposed to say? That moment? We talked about it earlier. You ever wonder at that moment how God could possibly love you? You ever, you know, when a word slips or a phrase slips out of your mouth that you wish hadn't and you're a little embarrassed and you wonder if God will hear you? when you've conducted yourself in a way that may be unbecoming and you wonder if God could possibly love you? When you've sinned brutally and you wonder how can God possibly love me? When you just recognize your humanity and frailness. possibly love me. You know why we need to have the power to understand this love? Because it's hard to understand. That's how real this moment is. It is hard to comprehend and grasp and, listen, fully seize the truth of God's love, how big and great it is. Because we so often listen to lies that tell us that it's not true. And so Paul is praying. This is God's prayer for us through the pen of Paul to say, listen, I know how frail you are and I know you're broken. But what you have in you is so great. And I know it's hard for you to understand that I would love you the way I do, but I promise you that I do. And not only do I love you, and you need to be rooted and established in that, but I want you to see just how big my love is. Look what it goes on to say now. So, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together, the, the ability to overcome the inner understand with all the Lord's people, to grasp, to comprehend, to seize how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of of Christ and to know this love that surpasses our understanding. How big is God's love? Bandon, would you get in place, please? How big is God's love? How broad is God's love? How wide and how deep? So big, so wide, so high, so deep that we c- it, it is all pervasive. That there's no way for us to exhaust it. There's no way for us to get to the limits of it. There's nothing that we can do to be separated from it. Read Romans 8. And his prayer is that his spirit would move in us with such a power as to help us overcome our misunderstanding or our inability to understand it. That we would be confirmed constantly and reminded of the truth, not only of his love, but how huge and and massive and inexhaustible his love is. That's what God's looking for. That's what he's looking for us. And that's what he's looking to do. Does this make sense this morning? All right. Verse 20. Well, 19. And to know that love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with, to the measure of the fullness of God. Now look at verse 20. Now to him who is what? To him who is what? This is the confirmation. To him who is able to do immeasurably, immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus generations forever and ever. Let's sing.
scripture where it says, to be still and know that I am God. So many times we have too many people talking, even though it's great to know we can come into his presence and ask and speak at any time. Have you ever had relationships where somebody does all the talking? Well, sometimes it's good to just be still and know that he is God and to be aware of his presence and who he is and the power of who he is and the power that he brings to your life through the spirit of God that lives and dwells within us. I love scripture when it says the same power that raised the dead lives within me and lives within you. That's power. Thank you, Lord, for that power. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. Thank you that we can come into your presence. Lord, we can open that door and walk freely in and know that we have the freedom to speak and to talk. But Lord, it's, it's good, Lord, to just sit into your presence and to know that you are a God and that you have things to speak to us. May we have an ear to hear what you would have to say to us, Father. And through hearing your word, Lord, that we'd walk in obedience and be faithful to the calling bestilled and, and given to us, Lord, and bestowed upon us. Lord, may we be the light into a world that is darkened. But Lord, thank you that you brought the light into all of our lives and into this world. May it be shown through us and each and every one of us, through our quiet time and through our time with you in your presence. Thank you, Lord, for that curtain that's been torn. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did at the cross. We are forever and eternally grateful. Lord, bless us this day as we go forth. Thank you for all of those who have served, Father, in our armed forces. Family members here that do have serving now, Lord, I pray protection over each one of those members that are serving. And thank you for those that have gone before us, Lord, and served and gave their life. Lord, we are grateful for that as well. Bless us, Father, we pray this day. And to God be the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen.